And this whole train of thought has been birthed out of the fact that a lot of times when we pray, a lot of our language and expression for prayer is based around culture. And it's based around what people have tried to tell us prayer is or what people think prayer is. But God actually has a way that he has instructed us to pray. And there's a way that we can connect with him in prayer that is very foreign to what a lot of standard ideas of prayer are. Is that, is that helping anybody? Like there's, there's, a way that blesses, there's a way to pray that blesses God's heart that is far superior than just a lay me down before I sleep or just praying just a, a meaningless prayer to just try to keep it going in a religious fashion. I'm here to tell you that prayer is air. That prayer is air. That to literally pray, pray is not a means to get gifts. Prayer is the gift. That just to be able to commune with the creator of the universe is a dialogue of majesty. It's a dialogue that we should, we should long for. That when soon as a lot of the times, the things that people are struggling with, you should actually use your struggles as a reminder to pray, not a reminder to continue to complain and worry. That actually the things that you struggle with are actually like bumpers at a bowling alley for a little kid to help them hit the pins. That the struggles in life remind us to get back in his presence. And we have to have that desire. And that's why I was so excited that after our last prayer, corporate prayer night, people were texting me the next day saying, when are we doing that again? Not when are we having another nice event. When, no, everybody's like, when can we all jump in the pool of his glory together again? When can we all get immersed with the revelation of him? Because you know the prayer meetings I want to be a part of are the prayer meetings that Jesus is leading. Because did you know he's interceding at the right hand of the Father right now? He's interceding and he's inviting us in to that reality to pray with him and to love on him. Amen. So I wanted to share this that is, if you go to Revelation 22, I want to set the, the stage for where we're going tonight. But you could sum it up in this one phrase. Everyone say experiencing Christ. Now, that alone, did you know that when we started Gold Street Garden, the Lord gave me three phrases. He said, experience Jesus, express Jesus, exalt Jesus. And that would be the circle that we would continue to live in, to grow in, to gravitate towards and mature in. So when you have the fact that we are experiencing Christ is the goal of prayer. It's the goal of the Christian life that we would experience Jesus, the real Jesus. Because there's a lot of people that are experiencing a church experience. They're experiencing an atmosphere of hype. They're experiencing a good message. But are they experiencing the Christ? Because I'm here to tell you, if you experience the Christ, everything in your life will change. You can't go back to the way that you did things because once you experience him, he ruins your appetite for everything of this world. That soon as you taste of him, you can't taste alcohol the same. You can't taste drugs the same. Once you taste of him, you can't, you, a lie doesn't come off your, your tongue so easily. But all of a sudden, a tongue coming off your mouth feels like you struck Christ across the face. Because you start realizing that once you experience him, he ruins your appetite for this world. He ruins everything, all your plans you had in the world of things. If, if I do this this way, do this this way. No, what happens is once you experience him, all of that is done away with. It goes away. So... I want to share that because the last prayer in the Bible is in Revelation 22. And right before we read this last prayer, I once heard a wise man say that God's perfection is Genesis 1 through 2. 
and God's plan back to perfection is Genesis 3 through Revelation 22. That God's perfection is Genesis chapters 1 through 2, and God's plan back to perfection is Genesis 3 through Revelation 22. What does that mean? What are we trying to say in that? It's this very fact that in Genesis, God created man, and when he created man, he created them male and female, which means that the image of God is not a man alone, but it's marriage. I know some people forget this, that marriage is the image of God. Why would marriage be the image of God and not an individual? Because God is three in one. So the only way you can, uh, the only way the image of God can be mirrored or brought forth is if it was through relationship. And a man and a woman revealing the, the diversity of the Godhead and showing his expressions. But the, the image of God is not just man. It's marriage. It's relationship. That's beautiful. That's exciting. And in Genesis, God, when he made man, did you know that Adam, when he communed with God, that he had no filter of destruction he had no lens of disappointment. He hadn't been hurt by the world. He hadn't been hurt by church. He hadn't been hurt by family members. He had no, nothing prevented him from standing before God and having real conversation. Isn't that amazing? Because what was the content for their conversation? It was God. They, they, they didn't, everything that they saw that was created was all from him. So that means that all the conversation was about him. But what happened is man, what do, you, what do you call communion with God? Prayer. There's a reason you don't see the word prayer in the garden. It's because it was just talking with God. It was just an expression, Adam communing with God. Could you imagine that if everything you've ever experienced that was bad was just wiped away and you stood before God, and you didn't have one thought of insecurity or one thought of you not being worthy, one thought of this happened to me, and that's why I'm in this situation. Could you imagine just standing before God, just clear slate, and that you are the object of his affection, and he created Adam as the champion, as the, the masterpiece of everything he created, even the stars, the moon, the planets, and he says, no, Adam and Eve, they are my masterpiece. I only created all, this other, all these other things so they could enjoy it. And then God says, let's talk about that. Let's talk about what I want you to enjoy. I want you to enjoy all of this with me. And then we hear about the fall of man. And was it a fall? This wasn't just tripping and getting a boo-boo. This was falling from the pinnacle of revelation, falling from the pinnacle of purity, the pinnacle of glory, all the way down to Adam was once having a conversation with God, joyfully naming all the animals, naming all the animals. There's even, there's even studies that, and I actually really lean towards this, that when God created man and told him to name the animals there's some people that even believe i know this is a lot of people won't even they'll hear this and be like you're just you're crazy but even when adam named the animals that when he named them life went into them that god was showing him who he was and that adam would actually call the animal forth based off looking at god and his expressions of character and that's how intelligent adam was and that he was just a sculptor that God wanted him a part of, of calling it forth and being a part of his masterpiece and companionship. But when Adam fell, do you know, everybody says, say this, sin makes you stupid. The way you can tell this is one minute Adam is having conversation with omnipresence and the next minute he thinks he can hide from it. If you're unfamiliar with omnipresence, that means that he can be anywhere, everywhere at the same time. And Adam, when he sinned, he began to hide from God. This broke God's heart. 
This broke his heart because God created everything to have conversation with him, to enjoy things. And now Adam doesn't want to talk with God because of the way he sees himself. Because it says Adam and Eve hid themselves because they saw that they were naked. Before they didn't notice, they didn't see anything about themselves because all they did was see God. Sin makes you look at yourself. Makes you self-centered. But when the light of God comes, it exposes the motives that are self-centered and it empowers you to have Christ-centered motives. And so Adam, he falls and he's hiding from God. And you know what? While he's hiding is what does God say? This is the gospel in its initiation. He says, Adam, where are you? He knows where he's at. But isn't it amazing that even in his sin, the greatest sin ever, you could say, even in his greatest sin, Adam's not pursuing God, but God is pursuing the sinner. That Sin didn't change the way that God saw man. Sin changed the way man saw God, and it broke his heart. And he says, I got to send my son to restore fellowship, to restore relationship. Amen? So I want to bring up that God, that this was his whole heartbeat. This is what he had from the the get-go, is that he wanted this relationship, this conversation, this prayer And then Adam and Eve, they mess it all up. And then we find this, that all the way at the end of the book, because I just told you the beginning of the book, at the very end of the book, we find one of Jesus' most precious lovers of his presence, which is John the Beloved. And John was the only disciple that was there with Jesus at the cross. All the other disciples had left John's the only disciple that did not die a martyr's death, but was delivered from two martyr's deaths of being boiled in hot oil. He was boiled alive, and he lived because, you know why I believe John got delivered and lived? is because you can't stop a revelation of God's love. You can't stop it. They tried to stop John. They're like, we can't kill this guy. Let's just put him on an island. And he writes the book of Revelation. Because somebody that has a revelation of God's love can't be stopped. And they don't even care what's going on around them because God has done something so deep on the inside of them that everywhere they go, they shift and shake everything. That that when God has done something on the inside of you, you make all of darkness uncomfortable. But you don't even mean to. You just walk in and you're the light. He loves me. He loves you too. That's why he loves me. You know, and you, you, know, you just start loving people because you realize the only reason you understand what love is is because he first loved you. This is going to help some people. So John, all of this, he was the only, we even hear, he was the disciple that rested his head on Jesus' bosom, which could mean that he was one of the only individuals to actually hear the literal heartbeat of God. He was that close to him. He beat Peter in a foot race to the resurrection tomb. He said that the the disciple whom Jesus loved beat Peter in a foot race to the tomb because a revelation of love will always outrun a revelation of condemnation. Remember, Peter was dealing with condemnation for denying the Lord. But John, he had nothing to hide. He was just like, I got to I got to go see him. I got to go see my Jesus. And when he writes the book of Revelation, this is what I want to provoke in us all when it comes to prayer, that you go to the last two verses, that John has heard all this amazing things about Jesus and his return. Did you know Jesus is coming back? Come on. If he's not, we're wasting a lot of time with these, what we're doing here. He is coming back. Prophecies are being fulfilled. The problems that you have in your everyday to day life don't even scratch the surface of the joy (laughs) that we are about to encounter. But guess what? Jesus is saying, 
my, ch- my beloved, you don't have to wait to get to heaven. What I'm longing for is a bride that wants to recite her wedding vows every day and get alone with me and just love on me and just prepare and just prepare and prepare. And I love this because Adam, sin caused Adam to hide. It caused him to not want to commune with God. And then we find at the very end of the book that the cross, the resurrection, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, that the signs, wonders, and miracles, all of this have provoked this man who's representing the church, John. It says in verse 20 of chapter 22, he who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming quickly. So Jesus is saying, surely I am coming quickly. And guess what? This provoked a prayer in John. And he said, Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. I want you to see that the word of God, that Jesus is even saying, I am coming, and John decides to make his prayer request, come quicker. Not because, I'm, uh, not because I want to be delivered from my situation, but because all I want is you. And God is looking for a bride that when we pray, when we go, that his word is provoking our prayer life. That no longer is our prayer life dictated by what's not going right and what's going wrong, but our prayer life is dictated by his promises. And when we read his promises and we find out we know he's coming back soon and he desires a pure bride, this is the prayers we'll start praying. Lord, I prayed this prayer the other night. It just came out of my heart and Maybe you've prayed a prayer like this, but I said, Lord, teach me to love you like you love me. I never thought I'd ever pray a prayer like that because I'm like, he loves me. Praise God. I want to believe for this and believe for this. But I have this this ache in my heart that I want my life, I want my life to be something that, that causes a smile upon his face that it called, that I want my worship to be pleasing to him. I want my life to say something. And the only way that will happen is if I allow the spirit of God to influence and to inspire and to instruct me into it. Because a lot of us, we do a lot of good things for church, but we do it because we think it's the right thing to do instead of allowing God to breathe upon us and and, and influence and inspire. I hope I'm getting this out to you, but this this is the prayer. The last prayer in the Bible is come quicker. Not because once again, a lot of times people pray, Jesus, a lot of times people pray, oh Jesus come because the world's going to hell in a handbasket. No. That's not why we want Jesus to come, because if he comes too soon, so many people will go to hell. The reason that there's an ache in our heart for him to come quicker is not because we're we're done with all the drama and things. It's just because we have seen him and it provokes something in us. And it's why he draws closer and closer because he finds that his people want him for the right reasons. They don't just want another meal. They don't want another car. They don't just want another house. They want him. And once he senses that, he can't help himself from loving on his bride. Is that what we desire? Is this what we desire when we pray? That, And I want you to turn to... Another, if you go to Luke 18, I got to set this up. Luke 18, Jesus is teaching on prayer. If you go to verse 9 of Luke 18, it says, Jesus spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Remember, we made this comment last week. If you think you're a good Christian, there's a problem. And what I mean by that is a lot of times people are like, well, I'm a good Christian. You, actually, you have to understand that the only reason you're even breathing is because the Spirit of God sustains you for another day. And the minute you start accrediting things to yourself, you, you know what the most beautiful thing about the cross is this? Well, there's a lot of things, but the cross will level every mountain of pride and it will fill every valley of shame. I'm going to say that again. The cross will level 
every mountain of pride and it'll fill every valley of shame. What, is, what am I saying? The cross, everybody, is the same at the cross. That it'll deflate egos, but then it'll also help those that are beating themselves up and holding themselves to a standard that God doesn't even hold them to. But righteousness, self-righteousness comes in so quick that sometimes somebody will pray for somebody and then they'll start thinking, well, I could start a ministry. Oh, I'm good. I, I'm, you know, I'm gifted in this. You, you better check yourself. I'm here to tell you that if, if you don't realize it's him, the devil will pull the rug out from under you when you don't want him to at all. The devil will sustain a prideful ministry just so he can expose that Christians are frauds. The reason we have to get this in our heart, it has to be him. It can't be just your own. And this, this is why there's such a balance between grace and faith. And we have to get this in our heart and understand but when we read this, it says that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray. So Jesus, whenever Jesus gives two people here, he's going to give polar opposite examples to make a point of the right heart to have. And you would be surprised as how he uses this here. Because he says two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, and if you're unfamiliar with a Pharisee, it's just somebody that thinks that they're very religious, and they think that because they go to church all the time and know a few things about the Bible, I know a buttload about the gospel. I don't know if you ever seen Nacho Libre, but the uh, <laughs> the the fact is is that is that the, what happens here is that the Pharisees are prideful in what they do. And they, they accredit that to that, and they believe God needs to bless them because they did A, B, and C. I confess, Lord. I went to church. I make sure I do good things. The only reason you can believe God for anything is because you put all your faith in Jesus Christ. That's it. That's it. And you'll find it all throughout the... You, come, hold on for a sec. Think about this. The whole Old Testament shows this over and over again. Moses, lift up your rod. A Red Sea parted. How much credit can he take for that? Could Moses start a ministry? Hey, everybody, do it like this. If we do it like that, you got to get it a couple degrees. To... David, a slingshot, taking out a giant. You go through the Bible and, hey, Joshua, take down the biggest empire city. You walk around the city seven times and shout, the walls are coming down. God wants to show us that it has nothing to do with our ability. But it has everything to do with us posturing ourselves to say, I want to do exactly what he says. When he says jump, I'm going to jump as high as I can. When he says run, I'm going to run as fast as I can because it's not about what I can do. It's about am I listening and am I posturing myself? That's why I want you all to know that if you endeavor every day to just hear from God and do it, you'll be made. Hear from him and do it every time. But you'll find throughout the gospel and you'll find throughout the Old Testament, it was never about what they could do. It was just about did they listen and obey when God said. And what is God saying to his church now? Believe in my son. So just like Moses lifted up the rod, the Red Sea parted, when you believe in Jesus, your sins get thrown as far as the east is from the west. I don't feel like they are. They are because God said if you believe, it's not about you self-justifying and working out a pension to get it all. It's about the fact that he said that my son's sacrifice did it all. And everything you saw in the Old Testament was foreshadowing and showing how simple it is. And that, that I, the Lord prompted this saying in my heart the other night that it's this, that we have nothing to offer God 
Yet he desires and longs for every part of our nothing. It's crazy. We have nothing to offer God, yet he desires and longs for every part of our nothing. When you read the new covenant in Hebrews 8, Hebrews 8 lays out the whole new covenant. You don't have any responsibility in the new covenant. You know why? Because God knows you'll screw it up. He's just asking you to believe. And that's why the greatest sin that sends people to hell is unbelief. Unbelief is the gravest sin. Because it, it's a direct smack in the face and spitting in the face of God to say his son wasn't enough. I know that's something we don't hear, but it's, that's, that's the gospel. And when, you, when you're seeing this, that in Luke 18, it says, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. <laughs> so who is this Pharisee talking to? He's not talking to God. He's talking to himself. This is, this is pride in its essence. This is called a prayerless prayer. A prayerless prayer. A faithless prayer is just talking to the air. You just, you see that, I don't know if you have, uh, just a reminder, if all you do is think about yourself, you think just like the devil. We have to move our affection towards him, and he inspires our affections to spread to other people and to move. And the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you. Watch the word I here. I thank you that I am not like the other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so as much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus said, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. What is, what is this lesson showing us about prayer? Is that God rewards vulnerability. He rewards those that come to him. Uh, you have to understand that your emptiness the, your poverty of heart actually reveals your capacity for him. I got to say that again. Your poverty of heart reveals your capacity for him. That the reason we are empty is so he can fill us. That God loves nothing because that's where he can be everything. He loves nothing. He wants to reduce us to nothing so he can truly be everything. This is why prayer, the more you focus on yourself in prayer, the more you're stalling the process of experiencing his fullness. That it's when we admit that we, that our, our need for him, that that's why the more you get into the, it's like a, could you imagine a fish on the shore and like we're just looking at a fish on the shore and we're like, hey, let's just throw a bucket of water on it. That's what a lot of Christians are. They're fish out of water and they come to a service so the preacher can throw a bucket at them, a bucket of water. What they need to do is they need to dive into the ocean of the secret place. There's a bunch of, and you know, it's, it's a, funny, a funny little side note is did you know God always used frogs as an evil symbol in the Bible? And a frog, what's, what's interesting about a frog is it can live on land and in the water. So why would God use it as an evil symbol? Because it's got, two, it's got one feet in, one f foot out. That that's why the symbol of Christ is a fish, because you got to be all in. You can't be, that he would use frogs as a plague to annoy, because they, were, they, they could live in the water and on land. But God is looking for a people that we can only live in his presence. Being able to live in the world you should, you should, there should be something about going too long without turning your affection to him. It should cause you to feel like you're not breathing. Does anybody hear me? 
that the more you, you get into his presence, the less time you can hold your breath in the world. Which, this is what prayer does, is prayer trains you to live in this world, but be not of this world. Because all of a sudden, you can be in this world, but you are not of this world because your conversation with God is sustaining you more than the conversations of this world. This is why people flip out on Facebook and stuff because they, they, they live to be a part of something. They're, they live to be obsessed with something. And as soon as the, the, the media gives them something to divulge and everybody becomes an expert at it so quick, but what if they tasted the presence of God and became an expert in scripture and began to learn what he has for them instead of just coming up with reading an article and trying to become professional at something that they know nothing about. We have to be a people that love his presence, amen? If you turn with me to Isaiah 6, is this helping anybody? We're growing, we're growing, experiencing Christ. I'll tell you what, we really need to get excited about Jesus. Like, we, pretty soon, we will all be out of here and no longer will the highlight of our, our week be a worship service on this earth. <laughs> but we will have a highlight second. Everything will be highlighted. We will just wake up and it will be worship. It will be glorious. The, the, we have to get prepared for this. And prayer is tapping into the frequency of paradise. Tapping into something. And I, actually, let me read this prayer to you. I've been really studying the Puritans a lot lately, a lot of their prayers, and listen to this prayer. I'm just going to, like, these are from the 16th century, people that wrote their prayers down. This is what they said. I love this prayer. It's called, Dwell in Me, Spirit. Lord, if you give me yourself, I will have every gift. If you give me your spirit, I will have every good thing. Come, Holy Spirit, and dwell in my soul. I know you will make the place of your feet glorious. If only I have your presence, I will be all glorious within. Lord, I have heard that Christ is always praying for his people. May I feel the real result of his intercession. May I actually feel his prayers and the warmth of that spiritual fire which is falling down from his prayers into my heart. Lord, warm my spirit and let me feel your kiss that I may now have communion with you, your spirit upon me and your protection over me. Seal my pardon, confirm your grace, and save my soul in the day of Jesus. Amen. And in my book, I wrote yes a hundred times, like all around that prayer, and uh, just to be in agreement. But there's something about, I've been sharing with everybody, I really encourage you to write your prayers out. Start writing them out. And that the next generation of Jesus Terry's will see the prayers that you wrote over them, the prayers that you said that out of my family, that they will serve the Lord, that they will contend for revival, that they will, that they will go after. Like you, you, in our generation, we kind of we be, sometimes become victims of technology and we don't express ourselves the way that we should in, in, the, in, in occasions that are so meaningful. I encourage you. That when you get alone with God, how many people are thankful that somebody wrote this down? This is a book full of prayers that are written and answered so that they could be an encouragement and refreshment to us today. You should write your prayers out. And the thing about writing your prayers out, that help, it helps you realize where your motives are. Because sometimes we can say things and almost not even think about it. But when you start writing things out, it exposes every little thought you have. It exposes, because you gotta, you got to really handcraft it. you got to really channel it. So say amen to that. So Isaiah 6, we're talking about experiencing Jesus. And in the Old Testament, we'll see these four shadows. And it says, in verse 1 of Isaiah 6, it says, In the year that King Uzziah died, now, I want you all to realize that King Uzziah was extremely influential, that in fact, all the people revered King Uzziah, that he did a lot of really great things for the community, that they liked him. And it's in the year that he dies 
that I, I want everybody to think about this, that even with culture and with kingdoms in the world and politics in the world, that it's when the world seems like there's no real leadership is when God wants to reveal himself. Because he'll actually remove confident leadership to restore he is the one we need to follow. And sometimes he will remove people that we even really like just so we will get our eyes back on him. And sometimes when we're focused on the problems that are going around us, if we would focus on him, he will truly detonate the work of the enemy. You know, no matter, we said this last week, that whenever it seems like the enemy is advancing, just remember he's advancing towards a cliff. Whenever it seems like the wicked are accelerating in success, they're just accelerating towards a cliff of damnation. That as soon as you see the enemy ramping up, don't get afraid, get excited. He's about to run into the wall of his glory. And it's about, I was reading Revelation the other day. Revelation 5, verse 8. It says that when John was in the heavens, he saw, he was seeing the scroll that couldn't be opened. And he began to weep. It says there's no tears in heaven, but John had not yet ascended to heaven. He was just still there as a man because he fell dead. And it says he began to weep and an elder came up and tapped him and said, John, don't cry. There's one that's worthy that can open the scroll. There's one that can open the scroll that has all the names that are redeemed because of his blood. And you know what it says? It says before Jesus takes the scroll to open it, this is what it says in Revelation 5.8. It says all the angels grab harps. And it says that, that it says that there was a golden bowl, golden bowls that were full of the prayers of the saints. That before Jesus opens the scroll that we all celebrate, before he does it, he has a little golden bowl with all of our prayers in it. It's kind of like, a little, my little girl drawing me a picture and she can't say in the line sometimes and she gives it to me and it's the most precious thing to me. <laughs> Jesus, we should have no part in the opening of the scroll. And like I said, we have no part because he knows we'll screw it up, but he says, every prayer that you prayed, it's in this bowl. And as I open this scroll with your name on it, this bowl symbolizes every prayer that you said to me, that you meant to me. And there's something, that's why I'm try, we're trying to compel a body of people that are hungry for prayer, that we'll, when we say, let's, let's have a prayer meeting, we should be more excited for prayer than we are for anything else because that's when we let him conduct the conversation. That's when we let him transform us. I'm so thankful, even Trisha here, the first time she came to uh, one of our prayer nights, her daughter, it was her first time she got baptized in the Holy Spirit just by being in the room. Isn't that true? But, like, she, nobody even came up and, like, said, let's pray for this. She got baptized in the Holy Spirit because the spirit of prayer was in the room. Did you know that sometimes we get more focused on, like, let's do a healing meeting or whatever. If, actually, if we did a prayer meeting, God will heal, heal people more accidentally. <laughs> like, if, when we get out of the way, he takes over. And that's what's so beautiful. So when, in the year King Uzziah died, so leadership has been dismantled before them. Isaiah said, I saw the Lord. Everyone say, I saw the Lord. Saw the Lord. Okay, you have to realize something. If somebody has told you they've seen the Lord, you know, I, I joke about this, but Alan Hood, if he's watching, I, I, I say this totally with respect to Alan Hood, but when I talk to Alan Hood, like in a one-on-one, -on -one, this is kind of how he is. He's like, it's almost like, it's like he's been <laughs> in the glory of God and that it, it changes the way he, he communicates and he talks. Like there's, you can get so in the, and I'm not saying to be a weird, I'm, not, I'm, I'm just saying that when somebody has seen the Lord, that it, it should be very evident in their life. And if we're talking about experiencing Christ, what should be our chief desire in prayer? That we would see him. And here's the reason that I know a lot of people aren't truly praying is because they, they look more like the world when they come out of prayer than they do him because all they do is pray about what's going on in the world instead of talking to him. 
prayer requests are flooded with what's going on in the world, and God said, I wrote the book. I know what's going on. What I want you to do is I want you to speak my promises. I want you to focus on me because the world, there's no news flash. Like when you watch something on the news and bring it to God, God's like, oh, man, I didn't see that. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Totally didn't see COVID coming. Totally didn't see that. Like, no, God is, God is shaking. He's shaking, but he's seeing if the way he can tell who his bride is is when everything gets shaken, she's standing. Because God is looking for an unshakable bride. When everything around us gets sh- shaken, he just wants to see, does that bride dress move? Is she, is she not moved? And the only way you won't be moved is if you are more consumed by him that what's going on in the world is secondary to what's going on there, what's going on with him. Amen. And prayer helps us get there. So he saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up. So what is God doing? The, uh, the, the, The leadership of this time is completely wiped out. And what is God? He's revealing himself to Isaiah. I'm on the throne. I'm on the throne. Did you know he's on the throne? Yeah. Not on the toilet. He's on the throne. <laughs> he's on the throne. And he is high and lifted up. And he wants to reveal himself in this fashion. And it says, the train of his robe filled the temple. What do we talk about? This is what the church, the, the reason God can't fill his church is because we won't empty it of our pride, we won't empty it of our religious ways, we won't empty, he wants to fill the room, but he can only fill the room if we say, Lord, fill us, fill us. You know, the Bible says that God's judgment is gonna come to the house of God before the world. And things are getting shaken up that sometimes we're like, oh, it looks like it's going really bad for the world. Well, the church better make sure they're they're where they need to be. You know, the world might cry louder because they don't know spiritual stamina. But the church, we got to be resolved. We got to have some resolve. So above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. So God makes these angels that they literally have extra wings just to hide themselves from his glory. He created them to live in his glory, so he had to give them extra wings just to cover themselves because his glory is so radiant. (laughs) And we can just go, thank you, Jesus. I'm telling you, when you get a revel, when you see the Lord, you're going to worship differently. And I'm not, some people may have a vision, like a tangible vision of the Lord, but I'm just talking about he says he is the word. And when you begin to see the word as the pure revelation of Jesus, it'll change the way you worship. We got to get, thank you, help me, Jesus. So uh, um, verse 3, and one cried to another and said, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out and the house was filled with smoke. Think about this, that this wasn't God speaking. This was just a voice that had a revelation of God, that a voice that has a revelation of God that when they spoke, they shook the whole house. That when you have a revelation of God, when you sing, when you have a revelation of God, when you speak, you begin to shake the whole environment. You begin to shake things and it causes a stirring and it will either freak people out and they, they won't want anything to do with it or it will draw people to repentance because I'm here to tell you that some of us that think we really know the Lord if he showed up in all of his glory here you would find things to repent of that you didn't know you know what I'm saying if you knew he was coming back in five minutes some of you would be like oh man maybe I did talk a certain way you know like you see sometimes we allow a message of grace and allow things to get us to a place where we got to make sure we allow his grace to expose so that way we get it all out 
Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that in a fearful time. I'm just saying that there's something about seeing the Lord. Remember when Peter first saw the Lord? It says that soon as he realized he was Jesus, he said, depart from me. I'm a sinful man. This is after he caught the biggest catch of fish ever. He's in the middle of the, the most prosperous moment of his life, and he realizes how sinful he is. Because the goodness of God leads a man to repentance. When he shows up, that's his goodness. Because when he reveals himself to us, that's him be, being good. It's not just nice, tangible things that reveal the goodness of God. It's the fact that he graced you with the ability to see him. That's his goodness. Because you shouldn't be able to see him and live. But we get to see his word. We get to see his glory. And that's his goodness. It's not just tangible things. That's where we limit the gospel. Which is why I got to get this out. Um, so, uh, and the post of the door was shaken by the voice. So I said, woe is me. So what is Isaiah's response here? Woe is me. Just like Peter. For I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. So when Isaiah saw the Lord, it immediately exposed his sin but he also realized all the people around him aren't ready for this. That's why if somebody has truly seen the Lord, you immediately have a compassion for the lost. Because that was the first thing that happened. It wasn't like, oh, I'm good now. I'm going to just work on my Jesus thing. No, it was like, ah, nobody's ready for this. And he was repentant. And as you, it says, for my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. It didn't say I feel goosebumps and I feel nice. It's like I've seen him. And it's exposing things that I didn't even know were there. And it says, then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, just like in the, the upper room, what happened? It says tongues of fire fell upon him. So what is this a symbolism of? That Isaiah says, I'm an unclean man. He's repenting. Because what happened? That it said that Peter preached a message and it says they were all cut to the heart and said, what must we do to be saved? That right here we're seeing Isaiah. He's experiencing the gospel in the Old Testament because what does God do to him? It says, behold, this has touched your lips. Your sin is taken away. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin is purged. This is before the cross. But he's responding to the gospel in the Old Testament. And it says, also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, so he couldn't hear God's voice until he saw him. He couldn't hear God's voice until he repented. His repentance is what brought the voice of God with clarity. And once the clarity comes, it says, he says, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Does Isaiah say, now that I'm saved, Lord, I really would like this to happen at my workplace, and I would really like this to happen. I, I'm, I'm not, and I'm not making light of those things. I'm just trying to give you a realization of how the church has settled for a very inferior gospel. And when Isaiah experienced the Lord, the first thing is his repentance actually allowed him to hear God's prayer request. Ooh. That no longer was Isaiah coming with a request to God, but his repentance actually allowed him to hear what God's prayer request was. Who shall I send? And you know, Isaiah, after he repents, this is what he says, here am I, send me. And you know, the Lord gives him a very tough task. He says, you're going to go to a people that don't want to hear it. They don't want anything. And he says, only a tenth of them will respond way after Way afterwards, you might not even get to experience the results of it. And Isaiah was just so cut to the core that he said, I'll go. Isaiah said, I would go. He said he would go before God even gave him the assignment. That's repentance. That there's some people that are waiting for God to give them the assignment so that they can get people to bless it and get. But he just wants to see who's ready to say, I'll go. Not what fits your ministry description. When you see the Lord, it'll change. It'll give you a holy prioritization. You'll, you'll see things different. This is the final thing for 
tonight. We'll, we'll just go for a few more minutes on this. You guys good? Yeah. I, I, know, I hope we come here for, for steak. You know what I'm saying? When we get in the Word, like, I think you all know we're a little different around here, right? There's not a lot of people that hang out on a Tuesday night late for Jesus. You know why? I think it's because God is preparing a bride that isn't limited to convenience, but of people that are just, he's, he's, he's just preparing a bride. Because one of the things I always say to myself, how do I know it's the Lord? Is it a sacrifice or is it convenient? And usually the things that are a sacrifice are the Lord speaking to me, not because he's trying to make things hard. It's because he doesn't want me to rely on my ability because the only reason things are convenient is because I'm relying on myself. They're a sacrifice because I have to completely rely on him. It's, he's trying to get me to die. <laughs> we said it last week. I want to say it again. The reason why Lazarus came out of the grave, the reason why he obeyed Jesus is because he was dead. You obey God the, the best when you're dead. That's why you have to die to yourself. You have to crucify the flesh because the reason Lazarus jumped out of that grave is because he didn't have a choice. The reason that you sin is because you think you have a choice. That's what freedom is. Freedom is the ability to choose. Christ has made you free from sin, which means you get to choose if you want it or not. I know that's a little deep, but read Romans 6 and get empowered. Romans 6 will set you free. So turn to Ephesians 3, I mean Ephesians 1. This is where I wanted to start. <laughs> so we will, but I'll just give you a little taste of uh, this because we had to, I, I said all this to say that I think we might spend a few weeks in the book of Ephesians. Obviously not just tonight, but we're just getting the appetite wet, just pivoting. But the book of Ephesians, can I just sum up the book of Ephesians like this? It is, you hit the jackpot of eternity, and Ephesians is letting you know how big that jackpot was. You read the book of Ephesians, and you find out how rich you are. You find out how blessed you are, and then you wonder why you're, you're kind of like so bummed about things in the world, but you got to get in this book and let it become a reality to you, and we said it before, we breach the heavens when we fall at his feet. And when you read here, I just want to, we're just going to hang on this one. I want you to see this. Ephesians 1, starting at the beginning, it says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every, everyone say every. every. Say it again. Every. every. Spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Now, just, just stop right here, right now. You all need to memorize this verse, okay? And the next time the devil starts putting anything in your ear, you just rip this one off your tongue with faith. That you say, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed me, blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. Now, we got to break this down a little bit. Just think about this. Blessed be the God of our Father, of, of, of the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it says, who has blessed us. Now, think about this. When Adam and Eve, we talked about earlier, when God created man, he created them, and it says he blessed them. Did man do anything to earn that blessing? No. So the new creation... When he says he's blessed us with every spiritual blessing, the reason you're blessed with every spiritual blessing has nothing to do with what you've done or what you can do. It's all about receiving the blessing of God by faith. And the thing that you have to realize, this is why we're so infatuated with Jesus. Because you have no... The, there is no distance between you and God that Christ has not filled. There is no distance between you and God that Christ has not filled. So your prayers, we said this a few weeks ago, that when you think of your prayer time, think of it like Jesus with his, his nail-pierced hands taking the words from your lips and carrying them to the Father's ears. 
that is the only reason you have an outlet to the Father. It's not because of how good you are. It's not because of your abilities or you're just really special. No, it's all because of Jesus. Everyone say it's all because of Jesus. You have to see. So when it says, blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. So I need to ask you this. This, this, this makes us, what is a spiritual blessing? Because the reason a lot of us don't get super excited about this verse is because you don't know what a spiritual blessing is. Because this is why so many people are frustrated in prayer because they're all after earthly blessings first. But God has given given us an avenue that he has made a way that he's provided every spiritual blessing. And it says in Colossians 3, because where does it say these spiritual blessings are? in heavenly places, in Christ. So he's telling us where to go. He's telling us the navigation. And in Colossians 3, it says, set your mind on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. So what are these spiritual blessings? Well, let me tell you this. What did Jesus say in John 14, 27? He said, my peace I give to you. How many people would like to rock some Jesus peace? (laughs) We're talking about peace that even on a cross can pray for other people. We're talking about a peace that when the greatest storm hits an ocean, he can sleep through it. We're talking about peace that when everybody is calling him the devil and he knows that he is Lord of all, doesn't just tell them all to, you know, blow up and smoke. This is a peace This is called a spiritual blessing, and the church needs to learn that God wants us to thrive in these spiritual blessings. And when you begin to mature in these, earthly blessings will actually become magnetized to you developing in spiritual blessings. That as you grow in the Lord spiritually, there's no reason, you know, there's people in this room that you work jobs and stuff. If you do it unto the Lord, you should surpass everybody there. Because you have a different motivation than the world. Spiritual blessings will cause you to rise when the world doesn't have the same motivation. The world is going crazy, but you have the spiritual blessing of Jesus' peace on the inside of you. So when everybody is wondering what's going on, you have a witness and that your spiritual blessing is actually manifesting heaven on earth. And while everybody is saying, what are we going to do? They'll look at you and say, I don't know why, but I just think that I need you to pray for me. I don't even believe in God, but for some reason, your witness is showing me something different than the world. That you have a peace about you that this world can't offer. And that's why in John 15, in verse 11, Jesus said that, I say these things that your joy may be full. What's another spiritual blessing? Joy that is independent of circumstances. These spiritual blessings, sometimes we think they're a whole home, but I'm telling you that this is tapping into the attributes of God, that you begin to experience him, and you begin to tap into that. And even, here's the big one you all have to understand, righteousness. Everyone say righteousness. Righteousness. You need to understand righteousness is one of the greatest spiritual blessings. You know why? Romans 1 makes it very clear. Romans 1, 16. It says, Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation, first for the Jew, then for the Greek, then to everyone who believes. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. So why does the gospel have power? Because it reveals that you're righteous. The gospel has power because it reveals that You can't earn it. You have to receive it. And if you receive it, you can stand before God unashamed because Jesus is your righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We've said this before. If Jesus could become, did you know Jesus used his faith to become sin? He used his faith to take your sin so that when you used your faith, you could tap into his righteousness. If Jesus could become sin without ever doing one thing wrong, how much more can you become righteous without doing everything right? This is the gospel. This is what propels us into freedom. But it says it's in heavenly places in Christ, and this is 
I, I need you all to, to see this more than anything. And this is, and we'll close, the worship team can come. I want to, I want to share that when it comes to this, ne- let's go to this next verse. I want you to see this. It says, just as he chose us. Everyone say, he chose us. Now, this is where Calvinism can get a little dangerous. We're not going to go down this whole path right now, but I want you to know that if you follow Scripture very thoroughly here, it says he chose us. Where did he choose us? Did he choose us outside of Jesus? No, he chose us in Jesus. So I want everybody to know that everybody has a right to be chosen in him. It's just do they choose to be in him or not? That's how you settle that right there. I mean, I know that a lot of Calvinists would disagree with me on that, but I'm just saying that I want you all to realize that, a, and if you're not familiar, a Calvinist belief is that God just picks who's going to be saved and there's nothing we can do about it. I, I know that that's kind of me being very loose about the whole description, but that's one of the things, and I want you to realize that there is choice involved. And when you read this, you want to see that we're chosen in him. But you have to make the choice that everybody's chosen in him because only Jesus is chosen. He's the only one. So you're chosen in him. We all have a spot in him, but you choose to be in or not. So just as he chose in him before the foundation of the world, that check this out. God chose you in Christ to be holy, without blame, and before him in love. think about that when you pray to God this is how he sees you holy he sees you without shame blameless and he sees you as the object of his love and the next verse goes on to say that he adopted us you know what's so powerful about that my children they came from me. They came, Jackie and I, we had children, so they're, they, we didn't adopt them. They came through. Everybody knows how it works. <laughs> but, but here's the thing is that being adopted means I choose you to be my child. Not that I have to. Not that it just happened or get, No. God says I choose you. It would be like somebody, you know, we all, it's just natural for us to have one our own our own children, our own thing. But you see, God looked for the most crazy people, the most people that were so far off, and he says, I choose you. Because this is why the gospel is so powerful, because it's adoption, is that he chose you. That it says in Romans 5, 6, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I love uh, uh, A.W. Tozer. He says, God knows the worst about us, yet he loves us the most. And I love that. It's so beautiful. But when we see this here, that he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, before him in love, I want you to think that this is, this is where we end, this is how you get it, is that a story that we know so well, a lot of people know, is when Jesus walked on the water. Is everybody, a lot of people familiar with that story? It's in Matthew 14. Jesus walks on the water. And what's so special about this story is just think, Jesus is walking on the water. How did creation start with the Holy Spirit hovering over the water? So Jesus is walking on the water, and Peter sees Jesus on the water, and man is fallen. Man is, can't do what God originally created him to do. And when Peter sees Jesus, when we see Jesus, when we see the Lord, Peter says, if that's you, tell me to come. What's John's prayer at the end of the Bible? Come, come, Lord Jesus, come. And it's like Peter just yearns. And here's the thing is that Peter begins to walk on the water. And in the natural, there is nothing that Peter can do. He can't remember certain techniques he learned in karate classes or whatever. To, he, can't, he can't conjure up walking on the water. He can't, there's nothing he can do to do that. He's literally accepting the invitation of God's grace saying that I'm going to throw everything that 
I think I can do or I think that I can't do, I'm going to throw it to the side and I'm going to respond to this invitation of grace. And as he responds to the invitation of grace, how does he take steps? By th he, he literally opens fire of his affections to Christ. He begins to look at Jesus. He responds to grace and he looks at Jesus. And this is what caused Jesus to be standing over creation as the bridegroom, waiting for his bride to come to his side to stand over creation at his side. And it's a symbolic form that the way that we grow in him in prayer is we respond to the invitation of grace and we begin to look at him alone because if you try to think of how you're going to do it, you never will. The water is not supposed to hold him up, but because he's looking at Jesus, what could not work before will work now just because he said so. There's things in your life that you think it'll just never work or I'm always going to be this way. I'm here to tell you it's time to respond to the invitation of grace and it's in prayer that you begin to learn his heartbeat. You begin to learn to grow in this and it's so important that we realize that we cannot bring the world to an altar that we haven't embraced.